Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Bava Batra Daf Kuf Yud Gimel. Today's stuff is sponsored by Lawrence and Michelle Berkowitz in loving memory of Lawrence's mother, Eleanor Lassen Berkowitz, on her 22nd year at site. A perfect mother who is a social worker knew how to bring people together despite their differences. May her memory be blessed with the support of her many grandchildren serving in Saha. Okay, we're going to get started with where we finished. So we were in the middle of Brightoad, if you remember. Let's just do a little quick review. We started with this question of how do we know that a woman passes on her inheritance to her husband? And in fact, he's the first in line. Where do we know this from? We're not really getting where we learn it's he's the first in line, but where do we know that she passes on her inheritance to her husband? We get it either from She'ero Zoishto, right? And then we had the whole question of how to read that pasuk. Or we get it from these psukim that Rabbi Ishmael brought, the first three psukim being about the concern that the woman's nachala will pass on to somebody else. He said there's so much repetition there, it must be that one is the husband, one is the passing it on through her husband or through her son. And then we said, well, if that's not good enough, because maybe you say, well, maybe really they're all talking about don't marry someone from a different tribe if you're the one in line to inherit because you have no brothers, right? Women who have no brothers shouldn't marry someone out of the tribe because they'll pass their inheritance on to their son. And by doing that, they'll pass it on to a different tribe. Maybe they're all talking about that. There's two low tosses, two negative commandments, and one positive, and that explains the three verses that are all saying the, basically the same thing. Therefore, they brought the Pasuk of Pinchas and Yair, and from the two of those together, you can get it, even though we had a question on that. Anyway, then we go back to where we ended, which is, well, by the way, there's two bright oaths that make it very clear, one focusing on the Pasuk that talks about the one about Pasuk Zion, one time, but focusing on Pasuk Tet from that chapter, and basically saying that one verse is referring to the concern that's going to pass through the son, and one verse is referring to the concern that's going to pass through the father. So even though we rejected it earlier or said it's not necessarily going to be read that way or can't necessarily, can be read some other way, these brightos clearly read it in that way. And each brighto is essentially the same. It's just that one starts with Pasuk Zion and one starts with Pasuk Tet. But each explain that one is talking about concern it's going to pass to the son, and one is talking about concern it's going to pass to the father. So the one we saw yesterday basically started, and I'll pull up the study guide from yesterday, which has all the psukim in it, and then you can see um, the psukim here. So Pasuk Zion, okay, and that's where the first one started. Sibat HaBem, V'lo tisov nechala l'bnei Yisrael mimate el mate. Okay, that's Pasuk Zion. And the bright had said that must be talking about if because don't do it, meaning because we're worried it'll pass through your son. That when you die, if you inherit from your father, it'll go to your son and your son's in a different tribe from you. And that's why you have to marry someone in the same tribe, so it'll go within the same tribe. And then the bride had said, how did you know that's talking about the son? Maybe it's talking about the husband, that the concern is she'll pass it on to her husband. So they said, ah, that's what Pesach Ted is for. The lo tisov nechala mi mateh le mateh which is very similar, right? One says mi matel mate, and one says le mate acher. Okay, the other difference, which is not significant, at least we're not going to discuss today. Lo tisov nechala le bnei Yisrael, and this one doesn't say le bnei Yisrael. Again, the simple reading, we talked about this yesterday, but I'll just review. Why is there a repetition here, according to the simple reading? Because Pasuk Vav and Zayin, we're talking about the daughters of Slavchad, and Pasuk Chet says, and here's the general rule. Right? And then Pasuk Ted is, right, we're worried anybody, not just the daughters of Tzlavcha, but moving from here, moving forward, if this happens with anybody else, same thing. But again, right, maybe it could have been said generally to everybody, why did it split it up into, you know, the here and now and moving forward or anybody else. So that gives room for them to darshan. And then they basically say, okay. So it must be, if there's another pasuk that says the same thing, pasuk tet must be about, pasuk, right, then verse 9 must be about worried it's going to go through the husband, and pasuk zayin is we're worried it's going to go through the son. And there you have both pasuki. Now we get to the other brighta, which is exactly the same content, just from the reverse. They're going to start from pasuk tet and say it's talking about the husband. Tanya idach velo tisov nachalami matele achil. That pasuk is b'sibat ha'ba'ala katum edaber. Now this bright, it doesn't disagree with the other one. They both are going to say the pasuk Zion is through the son and pasuk Tet is through the husband. Then the bright is going to say, it's just that one starts with pasuk Zion and says it's about the son and then says maybe it's not. 
And the second one starts with Pasuk Tet and says it's about the husband. Then it says maybe it's not. No, it's obvious it is. And then we're going to get to why specifically Zion was for the son and Tet was for the husband. Why is that so clear to everybody? Wait, Pasuk Tet is talking about the husband. How do you know? Maybe we're concerned that if she marries someone from another tribe, it'll pass through her son. No, it's not about the son because Pasuk Zion Amor. It already said about passing it on to the son. So what's Pasuk Tet doing here? That we're not going to transfer property to a different tribe. That must be So again, it's like a little bit circular, these bright toad, and they're basically all saying the same thing. And the bottom line is the Gemara is going to point out. Either which way you look at it, either Brita, which is basically looking at the exact same way, just a different starting point and a different subject, I would say. Subject of, of the first Brita was, I'm going to show you which Pasuk is talking about passing it on to the son. And the subject of the second Brita is, I'm going to show you which one is passing on to the husband. But both of them basically say, there's two Pasukim, and one is about the husband, one is about the son. So each one thinks that the last pasuk there, lo tisov nachalami matel matachil, ki ish benachalato yid beku matopene Israel, because each, right, everyone and every man in his property should stick his property, keep it stuck in his, in their tribes. So my mashma, how do you get from here to the fact that it's about the husband? Why is Ted about the husband and Zion is about concern of passing it through the set? Siman Shila Amar Kra Ish. Ah, the way to know this is because it says in Pasuk Tet Ish. Now, you might know in modern Hebrew, some women call their husbands Bali. Some women call their husbands Ishi. And in the Torah, it's the same, by the way. So Ishi could be husband. So Ish sounds like it's a phrase that's now Ish obviously means man. Could be anything, but the word Ish in the Pasuk sounds like it's talking about the, the husband. But then they say, that's not a good proof. And you got to wonder why he even suggested this. Look back at Pasuk Zayin. That's so far what we read. Ki ish, okay, and that's why I underlined them on the study guide. Both ish and yidbeku appear in both. Okay, why do I say yidbeku? Because that's going to be the next proof. So you can't say the ish is what proves it's time about the husband because ish appears on the Pasuk we said it's time about the son also. So, second option. So, again, we're going to have the same thing. It says Yidbeku. Now, what does Yidbeku have to do with a husband? Well, in Sefer Breshid, in the beginning of creation, it talks about Hisham man and woman, and it says, right, they're going to, Vidavak Ish Bishto, right, Al Kenyazov Ish Davi Vimo, person's supposed to leave his mother and father, Vidavak, and he's supposed to cling to his wife, Ishto. So, the, the, the root, Davak, connects with husband and wife. But then the Gemara again says, Travayu yid What do you mean? Yid also appears in Pasuk Zayin. That's not a proof. Well, Ela Amar Rava Amar Kra, we're going to have two answers. Rava says he's going to sort of take this previous answer and fix it. Yid matot. Now, what does that mean? Well, yid now the word mate appears in the end of Pasuk Zayin also, but not connected with the word yid but in Pasuk Ted, it says, Ki ish benachalato yidbeku matot. Now, when are matot yidbeku? When do two tribes stick together? When a couple gets married. And therefore, they say, ah, that's our proof. Yidbeku matot is a reference to when are yidbeku matot? When there's a marriage. Therefore, Pasuk Ted is the one that was connected to a woman passing on her inheritance through marriage. As opposed to, now, either which way it's through marriage, but right, to her husband, the one who she was nidbak to, as opposed to Pasuk Zayim, which is, well, she might marry someone from a different tribe, and then it'll pass to her son, who's from a different tribe. That's answer one. Answer two, it's really right, answer three, or fixing up answer two, but one and two were rejected. Rav Ashi Amar, Rav Ashi says, Amar Kra, mi mate le mate achil. The other difference was one said mi mate el mate, that was Pasuk Zayin. This says to a different tribe, right? One is from a tribe to another. It doesn't say different. Now, of course, it's a different, but a different tribe. Otherwise, what's a tribe to a tribe? But it doesn't say the word different. Now, what's, why does that matter? Because a woman who passes on 
to her husband, and let's say she's from Shimon, he's from Reuven, is clearly a different tribe. That's Mate Achil. But if a woman has a son with her husband, she's from Shimon, he's from Reuven, and together they have a son. Now it's true the son is called, that he's from the tribe of Reuven, but he's really a combination. He's got Reuven and Shimon in his blood, if you talk about genetically or something like that, right? He's a makeup of Reuven and Shimon. So you wouldn't really be able to call him from a different, like a strange tribe, right? A tribe that has nothing to do with her. Because in essence, he does have some Shimon in him. So therefore, you wouldn't call him Achir, someone different. You would call, you know, from a different tribe. You would call him, you know, from a Mate, Mate la Mate, from tribe to tribe, but not something that's totally, completely different than what, what she is. So that ends that section. So instead, we have four sections today. It's a very clear, organized stuff. The first was to finish up these two bright out and to explain why it was so obvious to the psukim, right? The two bright out really, in essence, agreed. Pasuk Zion is, a, is concerned, don't marry someone from a different tribe if you're supposed to be the heir that you're supposed to inherit. Don't pass it on, right, to a different tribe through your son. And Pasuk Tet is, don't pass it on when you pass your inheritance to your husband. And from there, if we go with this interpretation, then we get to the fact that a woman passes on her inheritance to her husband, right? This strengthens Rabbi Shmuel's position, although makes it clear that you really could prove it from those two verses. And you wouldn't necessarily need the Yair and the Pinchas um, Psukim. And then we just proved, right? We had two answers in the end, either because it says Yid Matot or because it says Mate Achil. Now moving on to section two. Amar Rabbi Yabao, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Amar Rabbi Yana, Amar Rabbi, okay, this was passed down to from four different people. Um, some people even say it was in the name of Rabbi Yishu ben Korcha. We've been talking about a husband inheriting from his wife. Now we're going to see there's one limitation to this inheritance. Now, even though it's the first person he's supposed to inherit, right? He's the first in line. However, he only inherits, and we have the same thing with a Bechor, only inherits what's muhzak, what's in her property at the time of death. And not what is ra'oi. Like, let's say she's owed money by someone. That won't go to him. Or the case they're going to bring now of ra'oi and where they prove it from is, let's say she's a daughter and has no brothers, and she's supposed to inherit from her father. But she predeceases her father. And then when she dies, what's supposed to happen? When she dies, so her inheritance, she has, right, whatever is in her possession right now goes to her husband. But when her father now dies a few years later, let's say, he dies, what's supposed to happen? Well, theoretically, even though she's not alive, she's the first, let's assume, right, there's no brothers. That was the whole point. She's first in line. Like, even if she has sisters, she's still first in line to get, right, to share. She's supposed to get a share of his property. It should go to her. Now, when it doesn't go to her, it should go because she's dead. It should go to whoever's supposed to inherit her. So it should go to her husband. But since it wasn't in her possession at the time of death, it does not go to her husband. Instead, it goes to the next in line, which is her children. So it would go to her children, and it wouldn't go to her husband. So that's what this law is. Where do we get it from is the question. Now we're going to darshan this pasuk differently than we did before. Remember what we said? We said, oh, right, we had two explanations, either Yair had a wife, and he inherited from his wife, and that was the attempt to prove, how do you know a husband inherits from his wife, because how else would he have had land that didn't belong to his father? This, a different option was his father was married, and then when right, she inherited something, and then it, she, was, right, she was in line to inherit property, then it went to Yair, and he got it from his mother, and it doesn't teach you anything about the husband. Those were two interpretations. So now we're going to see a bit of a variation on that second interpretation. So how could Yair have had something that didn't belong to his father? Doesn't he get all of his inheritance from his father? Right? In other words, all of his property should be from his father. It must be his father married a woman. Now, she died when those who were supposed to pass on inheritance to her were still alive. Meaning, let's just go simply, her father was still alive, the example that we just talked about. So his father, Yair's father, was married to someone, a woman, who 
predeceased her father. Then made to Morisheha. Now, who owned all this land, these 23 cities? His mother's father. Okay? When his mother's father died, now it should go to her. But she's dead. So who would it go to next? The husband, Skuv. But we know it didn't go to Skuv because it went to Yair and it was called Yair's and it wasn't called Skuv's. So what do you see here? The Yarsha Yair. Yair inherited it because there you see the Bechor, I'm sorry, not the Bechor, the, the husband doesn't inherit anything that came to her after death. Ve'omer, now if that's not proof enough, and we're going to obviously have to ask the question we asked yesterday, why would that not be proof enough? But if that's not proof enough, you can learn the same thing from, as we know, Elazar ben Aharometh, Yik Beruoto, where did they bury him? They didn't quote the Opasuk, but Bigivat Pinchas Beno, in the area that belonged to Pinchas. So, again, we'll say the same thing. Mina in the Pinchas Shalo Ayalo Lelazar. How did Pinchas have something that wasn't Elazar's? Milamech and Asa Lazar Isha, same exact case. Elazar must have been married. His father was married to a woman. Umeita Bechaye Morisheha. Umeitu Morisheha Viarasha Pinchas. Must be his father was married to a woman who died. Then her father died, or someone who was supposed to pass on inheritance to her. And it went to her, but instead of moving to her husband, because that kind of stuff doesn't go to the husband, that's called Ra'ui, what is supposed to come to her but isn't in her proper in her hands at the time of death of her death and therefore it went to Pinchas and that's why Pinchas had land that wasn't his father's again it's different than we interpreted this yesterday right just point that out what you see in all these dress shows that we've been doing the last few days is that there's different ways to darshan them to which the Gemara asks my Omer why do you have two psukim to prove this well if you're going to say maybe, right, if there's two psukim, maybe, again, this goes back to, well, didn't we say yesterday it was talking about a husband and wife relationship, right? That the that it was Yair who was married to a woman who he inherited from. So if you want to say that, then at least you'll say the other one, right? If you have two psukim teaching the same thing, it doesn't make sense that they would each be teaching the same thing. One must be talking about one inherited from his wife. Let's put that as Yair inherited from his wife. And therefore, Pinchas was the one who inherited from his mother. And again, he came before before Skuv because, right, or Pinchas came before Yair, sorry, uh, Pinchas came before Lazal because it was Ratui and it wasn't in her possession at the time that she died. And again, this is how we explained it yesterday, but without the, the, the twist that, oh, he inherited specifically and not the husband. The husband was still alive as well because it must have been Ra'oi. It was something that was not Muchzak and something that was not in her possession at the time of death and only came to her later and that's why it goes to the son and not the husband. Now, we have still one more question. V'chitema, but why, what if you say, like we did yesterday, that dinaf lalei b'stei haramim? The pasuk about Pinchas could have been that he got it some other way because he was a Kohen and Kohanim get land that's cherem, that someone says, this is cherem, and cherem means it's sanctified, but it's to go to the Kohanim. And maybe it has nothing to do with this. To which they say no, because, and then, right, one pasuk could be, it, it was, Yair was married and it went from, you know, through marriage and has nothing to do with this. And the other is talking about that he got it from Cherem. And that has nothing to do with our topic whatsoever. Well, I'm a crab bino. We're now going to add something that we didn't talk about yesterday. This pasuk is in Yoshua Perak Dalid. Now, by the time we've gotten to Yoshua Perak Dalid, we all know that Pinchas is the son of Elazar, right? If you got through the Torah, you know that. So why does the pasuk have to tell you that he was buried in the Giv'ah of Pinchas, his son? Everyone knows that Pinchas is his son. So, what, why do we call Pinchas his son at the, on that pasuk? To teach you, lo It's to teach you that why did Pinchas get this land? Because he was the son, the son of the wife of Elazar. And Bino means he was his son, meaning he got something that should have gone to Elazar. Meaning it should have been Elazar's, but it didn't. Why not? Because Elazar's wife died before her own father or whoever it was she was in line to inherit. 
And because of that, it could have gone to Pinchas had she died later, right? Had she inherited it first, it would have gone to, I'm sorry, it would have gone to Elazar. Sorry, I just confused the names. Would have gone to Elazar the father, but it didn't. Instead, it went to Bino. It went to his son instead of him. Because it says Bino, not just Ben, let's say, but it says the son of him. It means, well, the land that Pinchas buried him should have been Elazar's, but it wasn't because it was Raoi at the time of his wife's death. So it was something that was lined up to go to Elazar, but the, the way reality had it, it didn't happen because it was Raoi at the time she died, and it wasn't in her possession. And there we have, now it's complete. There's no other way to prove it. Again, there is, maybe, but basically this convinces them that it must be, this is the source. Again, it could have been from Yair also, but since you could theoretically explain that some other way, we have a second pasuk, right? One could be talking about through marriage. The second one can be talking about through mother to son. And again, mother to son when it could have gone to the husband, but it didn't because it was Ra'oi and it wasn't Muhzak, it wasn't in her possession at the time. Next section, section three out of four. Ubene Achot. This is the next in line back to the Mishnah. The sons of the sons of sisters, meaning if the sister of the deceased. Okay, should have inherited, but she was dead at the time. Instead of going to her, it goes to her sons. This basically means an uncle passes on his inheritance to his nephew, even right through his sister. His sister's children can inherit. Tana, the Brita says, B'nai achot velo benot achot. It says sons of sisters. It doesn't say, or sons of the sister, and not daughters of the sister. Now, this doesn't mean her daughters don't inherit, because if she happens to have no sons, her daughters will inherit. So moving now to Amabet, we have to explain. So what's the halacha? If a man can pass on his inheritance to his niece, also besides the nephew, so why does it say nephews and not nieces? To which they explain, Amarav Sheshet Likadem, what it means is the sons come first. And this is just like a regular person who gives to their own son, the sons come before the daughter, meaning... The daughters, the nieces here, will only inherit in the event that there's no nephew. If the man who dies, his sister, has sons, the sons will inherit. If she only has daughters, then the daughters will inherit. And Tani Rav Shmuel Bar Rav Yitzchak, Kameh to Rav Huna. Rav Yitzchak brought a bright in front of Rav Huna, right? These are Amoraim, but they discuss bright tot. That says, V'yarash, this is the pasuk we've darshaned a lot of times. Remember, if there's no brothers, right after we go through the whole list, if the father has no brothers, which was the last in line, you give it to the next of kin in the family, which again, we darshan, could mean actually the father, and it's actually before the uncle, right? And before even the brothers. Or it could be the wife, which comes before everybody. right? Which we said is the wife. But now they darshan the a little bit differently. Notice there's a vav here. Now, what the Gemara is going to say, or the Bright is going to say, is theoretically, you could have done this without the Vav. And what does a Vav do? A Vav is a connector. So what it means is it's connecting the previous section to this section. Now, the previous section started anyway with the first in line. Who's the first in line? The son. And then what did it say? If there's no son, it goes to the daughter. So in that level, it's very clear, the sons come before the daughters. So this vav is to tell you that when you get to any later stage, right, being the brothers, the uncle, the nephew, whatever it might be, makish yerusha shniya yerusha rishona. The second stage of inheritance, or the third or the fourth or the fifth or the sixth, okay, whichever level you're up to, is all the same is compared to the first. That's what you learn from this verse, v'yarash. Okay, since in this verse we're talking about a later stage, they say basically all the later stages are like the first stage. Just like in the first stage of inheritance, the son is always going to precede the daughters, and the daughters are only going to inherit in the event there's no sons. Likewise, in the second or any later stage of inheritance, the son comes before the daughter. Now, Becky, your ass is go to grandchildren. You'll have to wait then. That comes up in... Okay, so it's already going to be up after today's class. So if you're desperate to know, you can skip Kufir Dal and go to Kufir Vav. But that's where we're going to get to grandchildren. Okay, but we're going to see here right now, that's a topic for later. 
Here we're going to say that at every stage, if it's your brothers, so your brothers will get it. If there's no brothers, then your sister. Likewise, if it's your uncle, then your uncle, right? And only after the aunts, okay? So yes, the, the women are in there, but only in the event there's no males. Okay, again, if you didn't listen yet to Dean and Daf, highly recommended. You know, there's not a lot of time with Yantif coming, but make yourself some time at some point and listen to how this developed later on and how people figured out systems for how to allow daughters to inherit, okay? As the only daughter with three brothers, right? Important topic, though, is to figure out how daughters are going to inherit and what we do um, and, and sort of what happened historically with this whole issue, where it seems very clear in the Gemara that girls don't inherit, but things changed over time and they figured out ways to allow daughters to inherit. Tane Rabbi Hanina Bar Rabbi Bar Hanina Kamei Rav Nachman. Last section for today. Totally different issue. Vahaya biyom hanchilo et banav. Okay, we've already mentioned that Yerusha comes up number one in Mamibar earlier on, where the Benot Slavchad come and ask. The whole thing about Yerusha comes up there. It comes up in Bamibar, right? That's in Bamibar Kaf Zayin. It comes up in Bamibar Lamivav. This whole issue of worried about the Nachala passing on to somebody else. And then it also comes up in Sefer Tvarim, chapter 21, where it talks about uh, 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 the Pishnaim for the Bechor, the double portion for the firstborn. Now, that's not really our topic here, but we are quoting a Pasuk from there, so I wanted you just to know that that's in the context of, but it starts off, So in Sefer Tvarim, it's talking about all sorts of laws, and it says, and if it's on the day that a man is supposed to give his Nechalat to his children, meaning he dies, right? he can't decide to give the younger son the Pishnaim instead of the older son. Okay, let's say he likes the younger son better. He can't give him the Pishnaim. Pishnaim is something that goes to the oldest. But it starts off with yom and on the day that you give your inheritance to your children. What's this brighter that Rabbi Barchanina brought in front of Rav Nachman? Bayom, right, it's the same thing as in the previous section where somebody brought a brighter in front of an, an, another Emora. Because you can pass on inheritance during the day, you don't do it at night. So what does this mean exactly? Good question. And Abaye takes this very literally and says, something's very wrong with what you just said. Amarle Abaye, Elameata, sounds like what you're saying is, okay, Elameata means, but from here, that it all depends on what time of day a person dies. If a person dies during the day, then the inheritance will pass on to their sons. If they don't die during the day, like they die at night, what, the inheritance won't pass on to your children? Okay, because he takes it literally when he says, during, right, only in the day does, does the nachala pass on. Sounds like it doesn't pass on to the next generation if you die at night, which would be ridiculous. So Abai basically doesn't think that that's the case, just says this Brita, right? The simple reading of this Brita could lead someone to a very wrong conclusion. Dilma, din nachalot ka'amar, but he does suggest, he says, maybe what you mean is the law of nachalot, meaning, okay, meaning the judgment isn't done during the day. Ditanya, as it says in a Brita, now he's going to prove what he means from both the Brayta and then a statement of Rav Yehuda on it and a statement of Rav Chisda. So let's read. Okay, we've read this pasuk a million times, but we really didn't focus on the end of it. So this pasuk was, if you don't have brothers, it goes to the next of kin, right? And Yarash Ota, okay, all that. Then it says, after Yarash Ota, which we just darshaned a minute, five, three minutes ago, End of that section, this is a chukat mishpat. It's a law, law, okay, same kind of, you know, mishpat and chok are a little different, but a chukat of the mishpat, like a law, which we'll have to explain what that means, like God commanded Moshe. So what do we learn from lechukat mishpat? They say this section is all din. What does this line mean? Okay, before we get to explain what this has to do with Abaye, we'll get back there, but I want to take a break for a minute and show you both the Rashbam and Tosvot, the Ri in Tosvot, it's one of the main Balea Tosvots, um, who each have a different interpretation of what this means. So the Rashbam says, okay, I'm looking in the Rashbam, Dibor Matchil Ditanya, Klomal, Dahachinami Eshcham Bebrayta Achrite, Demishave Luhu Lechol Nachaloti. 
This Braita shows that passing on inheritance is Deen. Now, what do you, what do you mean Deen? It means it needs a court. Now, what is a court? What does it mean to need a court? Well, there's rules about court. If you jump for a minute to the next, and then I want to go back to the Rashbam, but if you jump to the next Dibor Matril Ora, if you look on the second line, the next line there, Klomar Nistaimaliotin, it's like a judgment, which means Sarich Shlosha, you need three judges, okay, which you could do regular people, but it has to be three people have to be there when you divide your, your Nachala, which we know why that would be, right? Because if you don't do it in front of a court, Right? Even witnesses sometimes, it's a little tricky. Three adds much more significance to it, and it prevents fighting and bickering later. So you have to do three ubayom. Also, judgments always have to take place during the day. And in fact, he says that we learn from here the dine mamanot are with three, I'm sorry, are during the day and not at night, because it says vaya biyom and kukamishpat, right? So between the combination of the two, right? They're two different sukim. But one places this law during the day, and the other says this is din. So from there you learn that din has to be during the day. So that's two main halachot we're going to learn from here, but the interesting thing I think about the Rashbam is, the Rashbam says, Salk, going back to the first Rashbam and where I stopped, You might have thought dividing property between heirs is just like regular partnership. If we, want to, we have a partnership, we want to divide everything up, we don't need a court. We can do it at night. We don't need judges. We can just divide it between us. Now, you might say, just like brothers fight, also partners often fight, which is true. But this is teaching you that Dean, right, that's a a requirement specifically by dividing inheritance, not by dividing partnership agreements, okay? And that's why it specifically had to set it apart. That's the Rashbam's interpretation. The Ri says something different. If you look in Tosfot, Dibor Matchil, Ora, Kola, Parashah, Liot, Dean, about a third of the way down, Mefarish Rabbeinu Tam, that what does this line mean? Okay, I'm just skipping the quote of the words. Le'inyan she'al korcham shel banim na'asim dayanim otam omdim sham b'shat tzavah osim din. Even if the, ju- if the sons don't want it, if there's three men there at the time that they're doing, that the father's, you know, speaking about his will and then dies, those three people function, can if they want, can function immediately as the court, and the sons have nothing to say about it. They cannot protest. And they can't say, I'm not going to read this inside, but basically they can't say, I want to go to a different court. I want to go to specialist court. Like, I don't want just regular three people. No. This is a dean to the extent, this is actually a, a kula sort of thing, or a, saying it could be done right then and finished. I think this is also because there's an interest to finish things up as quickly as possible. And if there's three people there at the time of death, and we're going to see this all inside in a minute, because that's what the Gemara is going to continue to discuss, a case like that, then basically, if there's three people there at the time, they can do judgment and divide the property as the father wished. Okay, so let's read that inside. And that, so again, what this means, or akola thing, or akola parasha, leo din, it puts it in the category of din, could mean, and, and by the way, there's more interpretations of what this could mean. I just gave you two. But the Rashbam thinks this means that it needs Dayan, which would mean daytime, which would mean um, three people have to be there. According to the Re, the big, again, he would agree with both those things. You would need day, you would need that. But the point is that the three people there at the time can function as the court, and no one can complain later and say, I want a real court. I want to go to a different court. Okay? Now, let's read this all inside now. So the first thing Abai says is maybe you're talking about the din of Nachalot, about this, you can't do things, you have to do them during the day, not at night, meaning that this is like a din and needs daytime. And maybe you're, it's trying to say, like what Rav Yehuda, and then what Rav Chista said, and with that we'll end. And this is what the Re was talking about. If three people come, when the, you know, to visit the sick person who then dies, and the sick person on their deathbed said, I want you to give this to this one, this to this one, that to that one. Kutvim, they can write it down if they want, and then it can go to court later. They can write down what the deceased said before he died. Ratsu Asimdin, if they want to, they can stand right then and there because they're three people. They can do judgment right then and there and act as a court, right? This is what we do, Hatarat and Darim, for example, which we just did before. Arab Rosh or Arab Yom Kippur, whenever you did it. By the way, if you didn't do it, you have to Hashanah Rabbah. 
Um, you do it in front of any three men, three men can function as a court. So there you have it. But Shnaim, if they're only two, Kotvim ve'eno simdim. They can write it down, but they can't become judges because two is not judges. Two is witnesses, three is judges. So if you're three people, three people can be witnesses also. So you can either decide to be witnesses or you can be judges. However, Amarav Chista, and this, and this is what Abai wants to say, maybe this is what you meant. Loshanu el abayom. The fact that three can decide, do we want to be judges or do we want to be witnesses, is only if they were there during the day and the person died during the day. And that's what you must be talking about. I'm just going to continue a little more because we're mid-sentence. But at night, even if there's three there at night, they can only write down what the deceased said before he died, but they can't be judges. Why not? We're going to see this tomorrow because if they see it at night, when are they going to be judges? In the morning, right? What's the problem? When they come in the morning, they're already witnesses to something that had happened. They're already testifying about what they did yesterday, what they saw yesterday, last night. Once they become witnesses, they can't also be a judge. So they can only judge what's different about night and day here is not just as simply as, you know, kolar parsha or aliyot kedin, the way the Rashbam said means you have to do with it during the day. But what Abai is saying is maybe your bright is telling us something more than that, which is that when we do it during the day, when we say the three people who are there at the time can function as judges, they can only function as judges if the person died right then and there during the daytime. Because then they either choose the option witness or they choose the option judge. Once they become a witness, which is if there's a time lapse, then when they come, they come more as a witness. I'm testifying to what happened last night. When they do that, because they couldn't do it at the time, they couldn't be judges at night because there's no such thing as judges at night. No court is held at night. They already turn into witnesses and a witness can't function also as a judge. That's a famous sugyu in Sanhedrin. Talk about a little t- in the next stuff. We'll talk about a lot more when we get to Sanhedrin, why someone who functions as a witness can't also function as a dayan. You need right, there a little bit of a, uh, checks and balances, right? You can't both be a witness and be the judge who listens to the witnesses, okay? Now, in this case, you don't necessarily need witnesses, but once you're going to function as a witness, you can't also function as a judge. So if it happens during the day, you can be a dayan. If it happens during the, at night, then you can't be a judge at all in that case, okay? You'd have to bring the testimony in front of three judges. Again, it doesn't have to be judges. It could be any three men which function as judges. And Abai basically asks him, is that perhaps what you meant? And in fact, the Gemara is going to say that Rabbi, Rabbi Baruch Hanin answers him, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. That's what the bride meant. Okay, it didn't mean what you thought it meant, which is if someone dies at night, they don't pass on the to their children. Obviously, that's not the case. Okay, so the four sections today. The first section was the psukim, and which one talks about transferring it to the son or transferring it to the husband. But again, both brights show that, yes, one pasuk is talking about transferring to the son, one pasuk is talking about transferring to the husband, and then we had to figure out why it was so clear that the last pasuk, pasuk Ted, is about the husband. We had two answers for that. Then we moved to um, when a husband does inherit from his wife only things that are in the wife's possession at the time and not things that are supposed to come to the wife later once she's already dead. He doesn't get that. That would go into her son instead. And we learned that from the combination of the Yair and the Pinchas Pesukim. Then we move to the B'nai Achot. We said B'nai Napadot. Why? What is it teaching us? Ah, it's teaching us what actually daughters do inherit, but only if, right, the nieces will inherit only if there's no nephews. Okay, even if they, only if they have no brothers, and that's true really for every stage of the inheritance. Um, except for where it's not relevant, like, like a, well, maybe a father would then go to the father's children. Right, there's no, there's no female on the father stage, right? There is no because the mother doesn't inherit. That would be the female, but there is none. Okay, so his sisters that we're talking about here, and that would be like, if it goes to his brother, then it'll go to his sisters instead, or the uncle, it'll go to the aunt, right? The father's sister. Um, Rabbi Bar Hanina then brings his bride to Vayabha Yamahan Banav, and Abai tries to figure out what does it mean, and that's what we just explained now. And with that, we'll finish for today. Wishing everybody a Chag Samach. The next three Dapim are already up. There's no Zoom on Friday. So as soon as I post this one, I'll send the links. I already sent them yesterday. I'll send them again to the, to the next three. And, um, and you can learn those over Chag and before Chag if you want. You can get to everything today. They're short to ping if you have time. Otherwise, you can learn after. And, 
And for those who don't have Yantif on Friday, you know, I already just recorded it for those who have three-day Chag. Although next week, just to already say, next week will be different. I'll do Thursday, I'll put up. Friday, I'll put up on Friday, because in Israel it's not Chag. And then Shabbat will put up on Friday. Wishing everyone a Chag Sameach and a Shabbat Shalom.